Hi everyone, uh, my name is Yuri, and today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, TF Data, which is TensorFlow's input pipeline. Uh, as a disclaimer, uh, this presentation assumes familiarity with basic TensorFlow concepts such as ops and kernels, uh, uh, and it contains a lot of code examples uh, that are not necessarily 100% accurate. Uh, there might be some details that have been removed uh, because they're either unnecessary or distracting for the purpose of presentation. So with that, let's get started. Uh, in this talk, we're going to cover a couple of topics. Uh, we're going to peel the two main layers of TF Data's implementation one by one, first focusing on the Python view and then on the C++ view of TF Data. Uh, and then I'm going to cover three areas of TF Data uh, that uh, might be of interest uh, to the broader audience. Uh, support for uh, non-tensor types uh, and both static and dynamic optimizations uh, in TF Data. So let's get started with the Python view. Throughout uh, the course of the presentation, uh, I'm going to be using the following example, uh, which is a pretty standard example of an input pipeline. Uh, what this input pipeline does, it's uh, reading files uh, that are in TF record formats. Uh, so uh, this contains records. Um, then shuffling those records, uh, applying a map transformation that allows you to transform the records uh, and parse them pre-process them, uh, and finally batching, uh, batching the pre-processed data uh, so that it's amenable to uh, machine learning uh, computation. Uh, and the idiomatic way to iterate through elements uh, of an input pipeline in TF2.0 uh, is by a simple uh, for loop, uh, and that's because uh, in TF2.0 uh, uh, data sets are Python iterables. Uh, besides this approach, you can also use the explicit iter or next keywords. Uh, now, as the, uh, the comment at the bottom uh, mentions, the user-defined function that you can pass into the map transformation can be both graph and non-graph computation, where the non-graph computation is enabled by autograph. And I'll talk a little more about that later on. Uh, just to contrast uh, the simplifications that happened in the transition between 1.x and 2.0, let's take a look at what uh, an input pipeline or idiomatic iteration of an input pipeline in 1.x would look like. Uh, and you can see that the definition of the input pipeline, uh, that is the top part of the data set, remains the same, uh, but the iteration is much more verbose. Uh, so hopefully uh, this kind of illustrates that uh, the simplest way to iterate through a data set has been made much more simple uh, in the uh, 2.0 uh, release of TensorFlow. So let's talk a bit more about what's actually going on when uh, you run that Python program. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through the different lines of the Python program and talk about what actually happens under the hoods in terms of what types of uh, TensorFlow ops uh, these invocation uh, correspond to. Uh, and I'm using a, a diagram uh, to visualize the different types of ops. Um, the gray uh, box uh, is the actual op, so in this case, TF record data set while the yellow boxes uh, are the different inputs uh, for the op, while the blue box uh, is uh, the output of the op. So in the case of the TF record data set, we have a couple of inputs, file names, compression types, buffer sizes. Uh, and uh, an important thing that I want to uh, kind of highlight here uh, is that uh, this op produces a variant tensor, which is a representation of the data set object uh, that can be passed between different ops. Uh, and we will see how that's used uh, right away uh, when we're looking at uh, the map uh, transformation. So the map data set op, um, you, you can see that one of its inputs is actually a variant, uh, which is the uh, downstream data set uh, that uh, produces the elements that the map transformation transforms. Um, other uh, inputs are, uh, they're called other arguments, and these are actually the captured inputs uh, for the function. In this particular case, that uh, that input would be empty because the function doesn't have any captured inputs, uh, at least not as uh, uh, outlined in the example. And the round boxes uh, are not inputs, they're attributes. Uh, the difference between inputs and attributes is that the attribute values do not change with different executions of the op, they're constant. Uh, and uh, the attributes uh, here are uh, function, uh, which identifies uh, the, the function uh, parse, uh, which is stored separately in TensorFlow runtime, but allows the op to look it up uh, when it executes, as well as the type of the arguments uh, that uh, the function uh, inputs. And again, uh, like the TF record data set, it produces an output variant. 
so a little more about user support for user defined functions in TF data. Uh, there is a number of TF data transformations or operations that actually allow users to specify uh, their own functions. Examples of those are filter, flat map, interleave, map, or reduce. Uh, and irrespective of the, of the mode of the execution, uh, TF data will convert the user defined function into a graph. Uh, and uh, as uh, illustrated on the previous slide, uh, the function graph uh, is a uh, handle to the function graph is passed to the respective op through an adder. Uh, a little more detail on the tracing implementation. Uh, it was originally based on a framework function capital Dfun uh, and recently switched to uh, the same tracing implementation that's used for TF functions in 2.0. These, uh, this provided a number of benefits, including uh, control flow version two, uh, support for resource variables, tensor, tensor array v2, um, and also uh, the ability uh, for users to specify uh, user-defined functions that are not necessarily graph or compatible, uh, as long as they're supported by autograph. Um, and it is marked as work in progress here because this functionality is actually temporarily disabled, and we're working on enabling it back on, on very soon. So to kind of tie it together, uh, if we look at the input pipeline definition, the four lines, uh, this definition of an input pipeline will roughly correspond uh, to the following ops uh, and inputs and attributes. Um, now, up to this point, we've only talked about how to define the input pipeline. Uh, but naturally, the thing that you would want to do with the input pipeline is that you would like to enumerate the elements inside of it. Uh, and that's where the iterator ops uh, come in play, because iterator uh, is, it can be thought of as an instance of a data set uh, that has a state uh, uh, and allows you to uh, enumerate the elements in a, in a sequential order. Uh, so what are the iterator lifecycle ops? Uh, the op on the uh, left top corner called iterator uh, that takes no input and produces a single output called handle is an op that creates uh, an empty iterator resource, uh, which is a way to pass state, uh, iterator state between different operations. Uh, while the make iterator op uh, takes two different inputs, it takes iterator resource, which is something that we've uh, created by the iterator op, uh, and a data set variant. And what this make iterator op does, it instantiates the data set, sorry, the iterator resource with that particular data set. So at that point, you have an iterator resource that has been initialized to start producing elements for that particular data set uh, as defined by the data set variant. Uh, now the actual iteration happens by the means of the iterator get next op, which takes uh, an iterator resource handle uh, and produces the actual elements, which can be a tensor or nest of tensors or possibly also uh, non-tensor types. Uh, and later in the presentation, I'll talk about well, what exactly uh, is supported in TF data in ter terms of types. And finally, uh, there's also a delete iterator uh, op that takes the iterator resource uh, and makes sure that the iterator state is properly disp disposed of when the iterator is no longer needed. Uh, this uh, final op, uh, as you can imagine, is uh, very important to make sure that iterator resources are not being left behind because uh, it is not uncommon for the iterator resource state to amass hundreds of megabytes or gigabytes of memory um, and leaving these around will, uh, can result in your computation running out of memory. Uh, as a side note, uh, when you're looking at the performance or profiling performance uh, of your program um, or input pipeline, uh, you will see iterator get next op in something like a time liar or, or an XProv or CPU profile trace. Uh, and this is the op that indicates the output latency uh, of your input pipeline. Uh, and so if that op is very small in its runtime, I would say on the order of microseconds, it means that your input pipeline is not a bottleneck. Uh, and if it's larger than that, uh, chances are you are bottlenecked uh, by input, at least to some extent. So uh, with, uh, now that we've talked about the different ops, uh, let's actually see how the execution of the Python program corresponds or maps to uh, the execution uh, creation and execution of the different ops. Uh, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna contrast the TF 2.0 eager mode style of execution with uh, the TF 1.x graph mode style of execution uh, to help uh, folks understand 
what are the differences uh, between TF uh, between the two modes uh, as far as TF data is concerned? So let's start with the 2.0 uh, eager mode. In eager mode, um, ops are created and executed uh, as the program uh, runs. Uh, so when you, the Python line that uh, creates the TF record data set uh, runs, uh, we end up creating both creating and executing the TF record uh, data set op. And uh, similarly, uh, uh, with the next line, uh, we uh, create and execute uh, the shuffle data set op, feeding the output of the previous op inside of it as part of the uh, input variant. That way we tie, we're kind of starting to build uh, the input pipeline, trying it to, uh, connecting the two stages together. Um, when um, the dot map transformation exec is executed, uh, the user defined function is traced. Uh, and stored in uh, the TensorFlow runtime, uh, and uh, a handle to it is passed as an attribute uh, to the map data set op, along with the input uh, variant representing the input pipeline uh, up to that point. And uh, finally, the batch op is created and executed, creating the final stage of the input pipeline. Now, when the idiomatic uh, way of uh, iterating through uh, TF data is used, that is the, the for loop for element in data set, uh, what happens under the hoods is that an iter method is called uh, on the uh, data set object, uh, and that actually triggers uh, the creation and execution of two ops. Uh, we first create the iterator resource through an op, it's called anonymous iterator, uh, and I'm gonna point out the difference between that and the iterator as I talk, on the, uh, talk about the graph mode execution. Uh, and then we associate the iterator resource with the input pipeline that we've created uh, via, via the make iterator op. And as the Python for loop iterates, we end up invoking next uh, on the Python iterator object. And this translates to the iterator get next op being created uh, and subsequently executed. It's only created once and it's executed as many times as uh, there's elements uh, in, the for, in the data set. And finally, when the Python iterator object goes out of scope, uh, the delete iterator op is invoked, which, ma which makes sure that the iterator state uh, iterator resource state is properly disposed of. So let's contrast that with how this would work in 1.x graph mode. Uh, so in graph mode, the execution happens lazily, which means we create the ops as uh, the Python lines are invoked, but they're not executed uh, and the execution is postponed until uh, the particular ops are run using the session mechanism. So just stepping through the program, we see that we are building a graph, but not executing it. Uh, there is a particular uh, mechanism for creating the iterator op, resource op and the make iterator op, uh, as well as creating the op that is later used for iteration. And it's only within the uh, run uh, part of your program that ops are executed. Uh, when the iterator initializer op is executed, we actually end up executing the entire graph of the input pipeline, uh, including the iterator op. Now the difference between the iterator op and the anonymous iterator op that uh, uh, was used in the eager mode is that anonymous iterator op creates a new resource every time it's executed, while iterator op creates a resource only the first time it's executed, uh, and any subsequent execution returns uh, a handle to that resource. And the reason for that is when we run the get next op, that get next op uh, will actually execute the iterator op as well uh, by the nature of the difference between uh, the graph mode and eager mode executions. Uh, and so that's kind of an artifact of graph mode execution and thus we need different types of resource creation ops for eager mode uh, and uh, graph mode uh, inside of TF data. And uh, there's no explicit delete iterator op, and that's because the iterator resource uh, lifetime is tied to the lifetime of the surrounding session. And so the, when the session is uh, destroyed, so is the iterator resource. So far so good? Okay, so uh, let's now, after, uh, now that we've kind of peeled the Python layer and we talked about kind of an op level view of uh, TF data, 
let's uh, dive a level deeper and let's talk about what actually happens inside of the kernels that implement these ops. And uh, like with uh, most other TensorFlow op kernels, uh, these are implemented in C++. So before we kind of retrace our steps or, or take a look at the example program from a C++ point of view, let's talk about what are the important TF data C++ abstractions. Uh, so the top level one is a data set, data set op kernel, uh, which implements the op kernel API. Uh, and uh, this provides a mechanism for implementing different types of data set ops through a single interface where the different implementations of the data set op kernel interface uh, just need to override or implement the make data set method. Uh, what the make data set method does, it returns a data set based object. Now, the, the purpose of the data set op kernel is to provide a translation between a graph representation of the op and a C++ representation of the op. Um, now, the data set object, uh, data set based object, uh, in turn has a method for creating an iterator for that particular uh, data set, as well as a method called sgraphdef, which provides the reverse of what I just talked about, which allows you to basically go from a C++ representation of a data set back to a graph representation of a data set, uh, which will come in handy when I talk about uh, static optimizations of TF data. Um, the make iterator method of the data set base returns an iterator base, which is uh, an interface representing the different types of iterators we have. Uh, and uh, the single most important method uh, in that interface is get next, which is the actual C++ method used for uh, iterating through the state uh, of uh, the input pipeline. Uh, and coupled with that uh, is the iterator resource, uh, which holds the state. And so as we will see, the iterator resource is actually the uh, entry point into uh, the connected structure of different C++ iterators through which uh, ops like iterator get next receive data. And the set iterator from data set method corresponds to the make iterator op, as we'll shortly see. Last but not least, uh, TF data has two C++ abstractions for representing functions. Uh, it's captured function and instantiated captured function. The captured function provides a mechanism for bundling a function with its captured inputs uh, and later instantiating it. Uh, and the instantiate capture function provides TF data with a mechanism to actually run the user defined functions. Uh, and so you can, you can perhaps see how there's a similar relationship between data set base and iterator base and captured function and instantiated captured function where the latter is an instance of the former in both of those cases. All right, so let's go back to our example. And now we're going to take a look at what, what happens when we execute the different lines of the input pipeline, but what happens in the C++ world. And unlike in the previous uh, Python view section, uh, in this section, the diagram uh, at the bottom will not be graph objects, but they will be C++ objects. So in this case, the TF record data set down below is actually an instance of the TF record uh, data set uh, that's of type data set base. Uh, so, and for context, we are again in TF 2.0 eager mode. So when uh, the Python uh, program uh, executes a TF data, TF record data set uh, with files argument, uh, we end up creating uh, the data set uh, variant uh, through the following uh, C++ code. Uh, and just for illustration, I'm showing uh, here how uh, that uh, op kernel uh, fetches the set of file names, and the set of file names can either be a single uh, string or a list of strings, so there's some subsequent uh, string parsing that's elided here. Uh, but uh, the important bit here is that we're then storing uh, the TF record data set op data set in the output, where the data set object itself is a variant, which allows us to uh, pass it on as an input uh, to another op. And that another op is the shuffle data set, which uh, uh, gets executed immediately after. Uh, and so here I'm illustrating how the op uh, receives uh, or kind of extracts the variant tensor input uh, from the op kernel context. Uh, and then passes it inside of the shuffle data set op so that the shuffle data set op now understands uh, who is 
what stage is producing elements uh, for it to consume. Uh, next, uh, it's the map transformation. What I want to illustrate here is how the captured function mechanism works. Uh, we use a captured function create factory that takes uh, the identifier of the function, uh, which is a, a name a list of attributes, um, as well as uh, any uh, captured inputs, uh, if there were any, uh, stored in the op kernel context. Uh, and similar to the shuffle dataset op, uh, we end up passing the captured function as well as the input uh, to the downstream data set inside uh, of the constructor. And finally, um, there is not, not much uh, new to see here for, for the batch data set op, uh, so I pretty much elided all the details uh, from this slide. Okay, so now for the interesting stuff, because this is where we are going to start iterating through the data set. So the first thing that happens when you call, uh, or when you write four element in data set, uh, under the hoods, this gets translated to a Python uh, iter invocation on the data set object. And the first thing that happens is that we create the anonymous uh, iterator uh, resource. Uh, and here's just an illustration of the actual mechanism that does this, as well as the code that uh, then produces the handle to the iterator. And this handle, uh, along with uh, the variant tensor representing the batch data set, is then passed to the make iterator op. Uh, so here you can see how we extract both the data set variant as well as the resource handle and use these two to pass them into the set iterator from data set method that, as we will shortly see, will in a cascading fashion create uh, a sequence of connected iterator objects. So let's take a closer look at what set iterator from data set does. Uh, it, takes a look at the outermost data set because that's, that's the variant that it received and it, it invokes make iterator uh, on that particular data set. And this will prompt a creation of a batch iterator uh, using the make iterator method on the batch data set, um, but also trigger a recursive uh, make iterator invocation on the input of batch data set, which is map data set. And so in that fashion, the map, in a similar fashion, map iterator is created where the map iterator creator uh, will also instantiate the captured function. So now we'll see that we have a parse uh, fn instance in addition to just parse fn captured function object. And similarly, we create uh, a shuffle iterator uh, and finally the tf record iterator. And because tf record data set has no inputs, this is where the recursive creation of the input pipeline uh, state stops um, and the control bubbles up back to iterator resource that re returns a resource handle. Actually, make iterator doesn't return a resource handle. We already have the resource handle. Question? Uh-huh. Uh, does the input pipeline have to be a line or can it be a bag? So at the data set level, the input pipeline can be a DAG. At the iterator level, it will always be a tree, uh, if that makes sense. Okay. So um, next, uh, let's take a look at next. Um, so when uh, the iterator get next op is invoked, because we're starting to iterate uh, through uh, the elements of the input pipeline, um, we again look up the resource using the lookup resource method. Um, and then call the getNext method on the resource. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, iterator resource is thus the entry point to the state of the iterator. Um, and what happens is this recursively calls getNext on the batch iterator. And the batch iterator says, well, I need batch size worth of elements, so let me get them one by one. Uh, so it calls to map iterator to say, please give me an element. Map iterator says, well, I need an element to apply user defined function on. So it's going to ask a shuffle for one. And shuffle says, well, I need a, a buffer size worth of, worth of elements to do reasonable shuffling. So it's going to call to TF record iterator. And TF record iterator will say, okay, well, I have these files and I'm going to open them and start reading elements out of them. So at that point, we start returning data back up. This uh, round trip between shuffle and TF record iterators might happen multiple times initially. And at some point, shuffle uh, has filled its buffer 
of, of elements used for shuffling and produces uh, a random element back up to the map iterator, which then applies uh, the user-defined function on it and takes its output and returns it uh, back to the batch iterator. And this would be repeated batch size number of times. Uh, then the batch iterator would take all, all those elements and create one higher level, higher dimensional element out of uh, the individual slices of the batch, uh, and pass it on to iterator resource, and that would get created, uh, uh, sorry, returned uh, out uh, to the Python program. Now, finally, when the Python iterator goes out of scope, uh, the iterator resource is deleted, and in cascading fashion, um, the other iterators get created because their ref count goes to zero. Uh, or we actually use smart pointers that are kind of connected between the different iterator objects. So far, so good? Any questions? Okay. Um, so up to this point, I talked primarily about an input pipeline that wasn't tried to be performance savvy. Uh, and it if it wasn't obvious from the, the walkthrough of the stages of the iterator, uh, it seems like there's a lot of steps that would need to happen to produce a single batch. Uh, and if all these steps lie on the critical path of your computation, then you're probably not executing at um, the, the best possible performance or at the peak of your performance. So uh, we have a TF data performance guideline that talks about different mechanisms to make sure that your input pipeline is performant. And the three main ones are software pipelining, processing parallelization, and IO parallelization. Um, and they all um, use uh, various performance artifacts, either buffers or uh, parallelism, uh, to allow users to specify uh, how their input pipeline should be executed. Uh, and in the context of the parallelism, and actually prefetching as well, um, they all map down to asynchronous threads being started uh, by the dataset op kernels, and they are running in the background, kind of disconnected from the get next calls, generating values into an internal buffer. And when a get next call arrives, uh, it just waits until there's something that buffer and returns it. So in the ideal case, there's data in the buffer, uh, and you don't, you don't need to wait at all. Uh, but in case your consumer of the data is faster than your producer, then you might wait some of the time, but hopefully not all of the time. So let's just take a look at how uh, this would change the diagram that we talked about. So what I did for the sake of an illustration is I added the numparal calls argument uh, to the map transformation, as well as a prefetch uh, transformation at the very end of the input pipeline. Could you insert the prefetch anywhere? You can, yes. Uh, the rule of thumb is that the one at the very end is usually the one that you get the most uh, mileage out of uh, because it allows you to overlap the computation of the entire input pipeline with the computation that might be happening uh, in the model, uh, either on GPU, TPU, or CPU. Uh, but yes, in theory, and we'll actually, I have a performance quiz later on, we'll see that prefetching or decoupling the producer and consumer anywhere throughout your input pipeline might be a good idea. Uh, so the changes uh, that uh, uh, reflect what happened or changes in the Python code uh, map to uh, the following changes in the diagram. Uh, we now have a prefetch iterator and prefetch data set at the end of the pipeline. And we also have a parallel map iterator and parallel map data set instead of uh, just regular map iterator map data set. Turns out in TF data we have a different op kernel for the one that uses parallelism. Uh, Do you support ragged tensors yet? No, um, but the, the CL that introduces that support, uh, there's actually a couple of CLs, but we are very close. Excellent. And do you see any performance decreases when using ragged tensors? Or so because we are not supporting them yet, uh, we are, I don't have a good answer to that. Yeah. Uh, I think through the, the course of the uh, review process for bringing that uh, support in, uh, we've been cognizant of making sure that the implementation is efficient so that it works well out of the gate. Yeah, uh, but you support sparse tensors. We do. Okay. Yeah. So the hope is that uh, the programs that use sparse tensors that could also use ragged tensors will see a performance boost by switching to ragged tensors once that support is rolled out. Excellent.
Thank you. Uh, and uh, so the runner threads that, uh, that are illustrated here, these are the background threads that de decouple the producer and consumer in the prefetch iterator and the power map iterator respectively. Uh, and they're actually not started until the very first get next invocation. Uh, so before you call get next for the first time, the iterator uh, is idle. Uh, there's no activity happening. But the moment you start fetching data out of the iterator, background threads uh, might be started or uh, thread pools might be created uh, that might start performing a background activity. Uh, an interesting side effect or consequence of this is that um, you know, the traditional way to look at the performance of uh, TensorFlow would be a timeline, which gives you a view into what happens in the context of a single step. Uh, and this particular abstraction doesn't uh, mesh well with the asynchronous nature of uh, TF's data execution. Uh, in addition to that, you would only see the iterator get next up, which might not necessarily give you a good view into what's actually happening at the different stages um, of the TF data input pipeline. And so uh, at the recent uh, Dev Summit, we uh, announced that there is going to be an open source version of a tool that we've had available internally for some time that provides you with all these details of information so that uh, you can debug the performance of your input pipeline uh, using the same tools that you know, we use internally. OK, so that concludes the section where I talked about uh, C++ and what happens in C++. Uh, and there's a little bit of a switch now, because we're going to go back to Python level and talk about uh, supporting non-tensor types. So TF data supports uh, more than just uh, regular tensors. Um, the different inputs or outputs of TF data transformations can actually be uh, a number of different things, sparse tensors, tensor arrays, nests of any of these optionals, uh, as well as nested data sets. Uh, and uh, here I just illustrate, it's not an exhaustive list, but I just illustrate um, some of the transformations in terms of the types of uh, types that they uh, support, either as an input or an output. What about NumPy arrays? NumPy arrays are supported as well. Um, they, they kind of fall into the category of tensors uh, by the vir virtue of being of trivially convertible to tensors. Uh, and similar to NumPy, there's something called uh, sparse tensor value, which is really just a Python named tuple uh, wrapped, uh, wrapped in type. Uh, and that's kind of the NumPy equivalent for sparse tensors. And I think ragged tensors have the same. They have a ragged tensor value. With the caveat that in TF2 and in eager, you don't actually need the value types because you can have a sparse tensor or a ragged tensor whose values are eager tensors, which are trivially convertible to NumPy arrays. Yeah, yeah. So that, the, the value type is an artifact of graph mode 1.x. Um, so the mechanism that TF data uses under the hoods to provide support uh, for these different types is uh, the TF data structure API, uh, which, it's, which is this interface. Uh, and we require any type uh, that's to be supported in TF data to implement this interface. Uh, I'm not going to talk about each of these, but uh, the list of methods is neither short nor long. Um, the, for example, the support for tensor array uh, was introduced uh, less than a month ago, and it was one day of work. Uh, so I don't think that it, the overhead of introducing the support for a new type, as long as uh, it's kind of natural how to implement this method, uh, is very large. Having said that, the support for Reddit Tensor has been in the works for some time, and part of it is because we actually want that implementation to be very performant, and so it prompted creation of new C++ op kernels to make sure that the performance is good uh, from the get-go. Instead of talking about the individual uh, methods in the interface, uh, what I want to do here is I want to illustrate how this interface is actually used to provide the, the polymorphism uh, at the Python level for different types of uh, TF data transformations. So for instance, if we look at the TF data uh, data set uh, from tensors transformation, which uh, is a data source that just takes a, a memory array and uh, views it as a data set source, uh, what the implementation at the Python level does is it computes or it invokes the structure from value method, uh, 
uh, to compute uh, an instance of the structure object and stores it internally uh, in its attribute and, and then passes the output of structure dot to tensorlist to the op kernel so the tensor data set op kernel uh, i forgot to mention earlier that at the c plus plus level tf data only deals with flat lists of tensors uh, and so we need a mechanism to go between that representation and the python non-tensor nested structure of possibly arbitrary types and it's the two tensor list and from tensor list that provide uh, us with this boxing and unboxing uh, if you will uh, between two, the two representations. Uh, from tensor slices uh, is uh, similar. The difference between from tensors and from tensor slices is that instead of viewing that as a, as a single tensor, we end up slicing it. Uh, so we assume that value has a uh, rank of at least uh, one, and we end up slicing it into um, uh, however many um, or slices it has, uh, depending on the leading dimension. Uh, and these are the invocations of the structure API uh, that would allow us to do uh, this kind of agnostically to the actual type uh, of the, the Python value. I also want to illustrate how the structure API is used in the context of user defined functions. Uh, in particular, uh, the function that we end up tracing is actually a different function than just the function the user passes. We end up wrapping the function that gets passed uh, uh, in the Python program in invocations uh, to from tensor list uh, and then to tensor list. And this is kind of the glue that I talked about where we make sure that the Python wrapper uh, can work with or expects a flat list of tensors and then we reconstruct the structure and the typing using the from tensor list uh, invocation because that's what the user provided function expects. And then uh, we again deconstruct um, or, uh, the structure and box uh, all the non tensor types in tensors because that's what the upstream transformation of TF data expects. All right. Um, so next up, let's talk about static optimizations, uh, which uh, illustrates that everything that I talked about up to this point uh, about how TF data works is only part of the truth. Uh, so in TF data, we, uh, we have a number of transformations or a number of uh, optimizations implemented. Um, here's a, a subset uh, of the ones we have and the ones that are in, uh, um, italic uh, are the ones that are enabled by default uh, and the ones that are not uh, italic then those uh, can be enabled through TF data options. Um, this is uh, how you would for example go about uh, enabling a map vectorization transformation if you wanted to. Uh, the TF data options has uh, other uh, uh, features. Uh, it's not just for optimizations. It's also for example for specifying threading uh, or statistics collection features, uh, but um, in the context of static optimizations, uh, I'm just illustrating how it's used for uh, those. So what happens uh, at the Python level when iterator is created is that the data set Python object has an options object associated with it. And we use the information in the options object to possibly chain additional data set transformations on, at the, on the end of the data set. Uh, this is something that the user doesn't see in their code, doesn't write in their code. It's something that we do at the Python level to allow us to uh, insert functionality that uh, we would like to insert. And uh, one of the main uses of this is this optimized data set that's used as an entry point for any static, uh, static optimizations that are to be applied to, the, uh, applied to the input pipeline. So if we take a look at the C++ level, at what's happening inside of the optimized dataset kernel is we'll again get the input of the dataset uh, and then uh, invoke a dataset optimized method. Uh, on the data, optimized data set kernel. And the code is actually quite long, so I, I just summarized it 
uh, in high-level statements here. Uh, this is what happens inside of the optimized method. We first use the as graph def uh, functionality to convert, to go from the C++ representation of the input uh, object to graph def representation of the input object. We then use grappler to apply uh, the subset of TF data optimizations uh, that are either enabled by default or uh, explicitly enabled by a user, which will give us a transformed graph def representing the data set. And we then convert the rewritten graph def to a C++ representation using graph runner. And finally, we update the input with the result. So because map and badge optimization is one of the optimizations that enabled by default, uh, the map and badge uh, stages that were in our example would be in fact replaced with a single map and badge data set, which is a more performant version of uh, the fused map and badge uh, transformation. And uh, last topic uh, that I want to talk about uh, are dynamic optimizations. So I mentioned before that users has, uh, have a number of mechanisms to um, make their input pipelines more performant. Uh, they can insert prefetching with uh, buffer size. They can uh, insert map with numparal calls or interleave with numparal calls to, do, uh, to apply various uh, performance optimization uh, tools. Uh, but what are good values uh, of these arguments like buffer size or numparal calls? Well, so in the context of this section, I'm only going to focus on uh, the parallelism uh, optimization. And uh, to uh, get you interested, uh, I have a quiz for you. Uh, <laughs> so uh, imagine that you have an input pipeline that looks like this. It reads from uh, a set of files, and then it applies two transformations. Uh, and on the right-hand side in the comment, uh, I mentioned how much time is, spent, uh, is required to get a single element, assuming constant processing time, um, through the particular stage of the input pipeline. So with this information, how much time do you think you would need to actually, uh, when you call get next, how long would it take to get a single element out? Three twenty. Three twenty. Uh, is the answer because everything executes sequentially. Uh, so when you call into the outermost map, uh, that calls recursively into the uh, innermost or the inner map, which calls recursively into the TF record data set. We spend 20, seconds, uh, 20 milliseconds there. Then we spend 100 milliseconds in uh, the inner uh, map executing F, and then 200 milliseconds in the outer uh, map executing G. So it's 320. Uh, I think you were getting, you kind of jumped one step ahead here <laughs> because, and this was supposed to be a trick question, but you already got the answer, so. Well. Uh, what happens here if we just add numparal calls to uh, the map transformations? Uh, nothing, except something happens. Uh, and the reason for this being 200 milliseconds is that NumPy calls uses a different op kernel, which has a background thread that will be performing activity independently of the consumer of the data. So the very first element will actually take 320 milliseconds, but then over time, there's going to be the, the processing done for the three different stages will be actually overlapped because there's now two background threads uh, doing everything in parallel. The parallelism is one at each stage, but that still gives you 200 milliseconds in total, um, in kind of the stable state. Uh, is it a correct mental model to think that this implies prefetch? Or? Yes, that, that's a very good mental model. Uh, it's parallel map is in fact doing prefetching by the virtue of using a background thread. Uh, and so in, in a way, this is an uh, you know, answer to your question where prefetching inside of the input pipeline, not just at the very end, uh, might provide benefits. Um, question. So does that imply that the map function has to be traced? Like, for example, if the map function is just a pattern function, and if you have multi-threading on pattern function, it doesn't really work because of geo. So I think the answer is 
you will get these benefits irrespective of what the, the cost, the constant cost of the Python function is, uh, of the function passed uh, into uh, the map transformation. If it's implemented as a PyFunk, that function itself might be, oh, I see what you're saying, that multiple uh, functions would be escaping into Python. Uh, that's a good point, uh, possibly. Uh, I would yeah. need to. I would want to convince myself that they actually all content for the same. Yeah, log. By the way, <laughs> if you ever use Python, you need to make sure your Python is thread safe. It's very hard for the TensorFlow runtime to not accidentally run Python code for many threads at the same time. Yeah, uh, I think the the bottom line here is that if you can avoid using Python, avoid uh, using Python, and for instance, uh, use autograph. Uh, so. Perhaps might not be surprising that if you increase uh, the values of numparal calls because you know how much time you're going to spend in each of those stages, uh, you can get to the optimal output latency of this input pipeline. You cannot run any faster than the slowest uh, part of the input pipeline, which in this case is the sequential TF record reader. Uh, there might actually be a way to speed this up even further by, by using interleave with uh, numparal calls over the different readers, but uh, instead of kind of exploring that avenue, what I want to ask is, what do you think happens here? Uh, yeah, I think the answer is it, uh, uh, the answer is it depends. Uh, uh, it might actually run well, like well enough, uh, because number of calls doesn't mean that you create. 1,000 or that many threads, uh, at least in the case of map transformation anyhow. It means that uh, you allow to schedule as many ops into the interop uh, thread pool at the same time. Uh, and because you allow to schedule them at the same time, you need a place to store them. So if nothing else, the downside of uh, specifying a very large value of numparal calls is that you're going to use more memory to store these intermediate values that then you would actually need for equal performance, uh, which might hurt your uh, temporal locality uh, or thread locality. So yes, the performance might actually uh, become worse, but the reasons for why uh, can be subtle and environment uh, specific. You said earlier that the ops create their own threads. Is that actually the case, or do they use the shared thread pools in the executor? They create their own thread. Uh, Parallel map, prefetch, end up creating their own thread. Uh, Parallel interleave creates its own thread pool. Under the hoods, they end up using this abstraction of an unbounded, unbounded thread pool, if you are familiar with that, which was needed, which was introduced recently to combat uh, memory fragmentation issues in the open source memory allocator. Um, resulting from excessive thread creation. So the unbounded thread pool that TF data uses uh, creates this illusion of logical threads that are mapped onto a smaller subset of physical threads, but they're, they're different from like, the interrupt thread pools uh, or any of the like, core TensorFlow runtime uh, thread pools. Uh, we do rely in TF data on the interrupt thread pool for the execution of the user-defined functions by default, uh, but there's a, also an option to override that. Uh, and we also, by default, take advantage or inherit the setting of the intra-op parallelism. And there is also a way to override that uh, just for TF data ops. And uh, as a matter of fact, our experience has been that disabling intra-op parallelism for and this is perhaps not a surprise to you, but disabling intra parallelism altogether for uh, CPU contended input pipelines gives you 10, 20% speed up. Uh, because you don't need to parallelize the individual ops, you get the parallelism by, by running multiple of them in parallel. Do we have any guides internally about how you can do like tricks with TF data to get performance enhancements? Uh, so so great question. So instead of having guides, why not just uh, have TF data uh, do the hard work for you? Uh, 
<laughs> and so this is something close to my heart because I, I worked both on TF data performance in the early days in terms of exposing these knobs, and then I worked very hard on making sure that users don't need to use these knobs because there is something that does a good enough job automatically. Uh, and I, you might think, well, this seems like a good fit for reinforcement learning since we're in I don't know, RMI. Uh, and that's something that I explored as an idea. Uh, I didn't get it to work, uh, but that might be because of me and not because of reinforcement learning. The issue, <laughs> uh, the issue with re reinforcement learning, so the idea is this. Uh, what if uh, you just pick some values uh, for the different parallelism knobs in your input pipeline, observe, observe the behavior, and then try some different values and use a smart algorithm that kind of converges to uh, hopefully the global uh, optimum? Well, it turns out that the convergence was very slow. You know, and if you set abysmal parameters for something that could be heavily parallelized, then you would need a very long time to actually realize that this is slow because of poor parameters as opposed to this is slow because that's how fast the input pipeline runs. So instead of exploring reinforcement learning that tries to modify the parameters, uh, I ended up, uh, or TF Data uh, has, a, has an analytical model that models the performance of the input pipeline that's currently instantiated. Um, and there's a little bit of math in my presentation uh, because I'm uh, originally a formal uh, verification uh, person. So here's some math for you. Uh, you can model the output latency of a node uh, as a function of the output latencies of its inputs. Uh, and uh, there was, the challenge was how do you implement these two functions? Uh, the, a processing time uh, of a uh, node as well as the, the lambda function that kind of captures uh, what the, the node itself does. So the processing time uh, is modeled through lightweight instrumentation of the C++ uh, implementation we have. By lightweight, I mean it imposes roughly 100 nanoseconds of overhead on the critical path. And we, take, uh, we keep track of uh, node creation, deletion, as well as the computation, the processing time spent within a node and a user-defined function. Um, and the lambda, which is kind of the, the transformation-specific functionality, which maps how the output latencies of the inputs correspond to the output latency of uh, the op. Uh, turns out there is a fairly small number of categories of nodes for we, uh, each of which there is a different type of lambda. Um, and uh, the auto-tuning mechanism then takes advantage of these two implementation artifacts to kind of tie it all together. Uh, and we start a background thread that periodically performs the following optimization. Uh, we snapshot the state of the analytical model, which captures the processing times of the dif uh, different iterators that are currently floating around. Uh, and then we perform a very simple hill climbing uh, algorithm that allocates threads or cores uh, to parallelism knobs that provide the greatest benefit. So it's a greedy algorithm, assuming that this optimization is actually uh, uh, monotonic. And if you do that, you can specify auto-tune for non-parallel calls in this example. And as long as you have 16 or more cores, you get the same output latency that you would get uh, out of uh, the manually tuned one. Uh, and the key is that it will actually not over-provision by you know, an order of magnitude. It might over-provision a little bit, but not 1,024. And that's it.